Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Human Trafficking, Identifying and Responding to Victims in the Healthcare Setting. My name is Allison Friedman, and I'm with OJJDP's PowerPoint slides and other important documents, you may do so by locating the handouts pod directly above the chat area. Click on the name of the file and then click the download button. At the end of today's webinar, there will be a Q&A session where the presenter will address some of the questions posed during the presentation. Please type your questions into the chat box as they arise. For those of you participating in today's webinar as a group, please take a minute and help us count. Go to the chat window and type in the total number of additional people in the room with you today. If you are viewing alone, there is no need to type anything into the chat pod at this time. At the conclusion of today's webinar, you will be provided with a link to a brief survey about today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete the survey. Following today's webinar, attendees will be sent a certificate of attendance following the conclusion of the event and are sent via an Adobe Connect thank you email. Please keep an eye on your email for your certificate. Finally, this event will be archived in approximately three weeks on OJJDP's online university at www.ojjdpou.org where you can also view past webinars. Again, thank you for joining us today. I will now turn it over to Nadia Eli from Fox Valley Technical College National Criminal Justice Training Center to begin today's webinar. Thank you, Allison. I appreciate the introduction. My name is Nadia Eli, and I'm a project coordinator with the National Criminal Justice Training Center, representing the Amber Alert Training and Technical Assistance Program. The Amber Alert Training and Technical Assistance Program has partnered with OJJDP's National Training and Technical Assistance Center to host this webinar as part of our Amber Alert webinar series. In conjunction with our mission, the series works to bring together state, local, and tribal subject matter experts to present and discuss critical issues related to missing, abducted, and exploited children. To learn more about the Amber Alert program, our training and technical assistance opportunities, and to view past webinars, please visit our website link available on this slide. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce and turn today's presentation over to Holly Gibbs, our presenter and subject matter expert. Holly. Thanks, Nadia. Uh, my name is Holly Gibbs, and I am the director of Dignity Health's Human Trafficking Response Program. So this is a program that launched in 2014 and has been implemented system-wide, beginning in our emergency departments and labor and delivery and postpartum departments in nearly 40 hospitals across three states. And we're now uh, moving our attention to clinics, physicians' offices, community centers, and outreach sites. So we've learned a lot, and, and we've made a lot of progress in the past two years, three years, uh, but um, we continue to learn. And so um, I'm eager and excited to share what we've done and what we've learned at Dignity Health, um, but also to continue to learn from each other. Um, beyond this webinar, there will be other opportunities for presentations and, and connections and, and shared learnings. So a little bit about my background. Um, I am a survivor of sex trafficking. I was lured away from home when I was 14 years old by a man I met at my local shopping mall. And this man promised um, if, I, if I wanted to run away with him that he could help me become a musician or a model or something glamorous in Los Angeles, California. 
so I was born and raised in South Jersey, and this sounded like a great opportunity to me. I was very fearful of going into high school, and so I made this decision to run away. But what ultimately happened is this person basically forced me into prostitution in Atlantic City, New Jersey. I was trafficked for two nights before I was arrested by law enforcement. And um, through the course of my, um, uh, in the weeks following this experience, um, I had to go through an emergency department. So I had an experience with uh, frontline healthcare staff who were uh, wanting to help me but definitely weren't sure how to go about doing that. I remember being left in a bright, white, sterile room by myself. Um, I was feeling very, very isolated. I also had to be assessed by um, a psychiatrist in order to be released and that wasn't um, uh, a great experience. I also had to be assessed by an OBGYN physician and um, was ultimately placed in a mental health facility because in 1992 um, in South Jersey, there were no programs to support a child who had been uh, prostituted. So I had a lot of experience um, working, or I, I had a lot of experience with law enforcement and with healthcare professionals who were trying to help me. Um, and those experiences um, make me passionate, not just about this cause, but about this program. Um, it brings value to those experiences in 1992 to be able to share what happened with professionals and um, use that experience to help explain what I really needed. But I've also worked with other subject matter experts across the country, including other survivors of labor and sex trafficking, who were trafficked for weeks, months, or even years. And they also had numerous encounters with the healthcare system. And so um, their experiences also make me very passionate about this program. I know survivors who were in and out of clinics, emergency departments, even had children with their traffickers and were not identified as victims when in the healthcare system. So it's a true missed opportunity um, to, to connect with someone who's being victimized and to help intervene. And so that's why we're here today. Healthcare professionals are among the few who will come into contact with victims. So there was one study published in the Annals of Health Law in 2014 that found um, nearly 88% of sex trafficking survivors had reported some kind of contact with the healthcare system while being victimized, and they weren't appropriately identified or assisted. Another more recent um, study comes from the Coalition to Abolish Slavery and Trafficking. They published a survey report earlier this year in which they surveyed both labor and sex trafficking survivors. Um, I believe it was 55 participants and over half reported at least one encounter with the healthcare system. And nearly 97% of that group stated they received no information about human trafficking or resources for victims from that provider. So these studies underscore um, the reality that medical providers are often unprepared to identify and respond to victims. So at Dignity Health, <clears throat> our mission is to deliver compassionate, high quality, and affordable patient-centered care to serve and advocate for the poor and underserved and to partner with others in the community to improve the quality of life. So not only does this program align with our mission, but so does sharing what we're doing, sharing this program with others. So on that note, um, if you're not already aware of this, um, Dignity Health recently released a shared learnings manual. It's about a 50-page document that details our human trafficking response program, um, the structure of the program, and it includes uh, uh, descriptions of our education and examples of our internal resources like our victim response procedures. This is available for download. Um, it's for public use. And you can find this resource at dignityhealth.org 
uh, backslash human trafficking response with dashes between those words. And so a lot of what I'm going to be covering today is also included in that manual, and I, be, I may be referencing that uh, a few times. So my objectives today are to uh, describe our program structure, to describe the education that we implemented, and to, dis to describe our, our protocols. Um, so just to be clear, the, the goal of this webinar today isn't exactly to provide education on human trafficking 101 or victim-centered care or trauma-informed care. It's more to describe what we've done, what components we've included, and what we recommend other healthcare systems include in their own programs. So this slide offers an overview of our human trafficking response program, what we've done so far. So I'm going to re reference our shared learnings manual again. Um, <clears throat> this manual is, is, is um, broken down into different sections. And the first section offers a real detailed description of what we've done at Dignity Health. So my first recommendation is if you're a healthcare system, no matter how big or small, I recommend that you have all your pieces in place before you launch your program. And the reason is if you go to a particular hospital in your system or a particular department and you provide education on human trafficking, this, this can be very um, disturbing content for folks and, and people can leave um, just extremely passionate about doing something. And, and um, a lot of times uh, after education, nurses and physicians and social workers, they realize that they've had this patient or they may realize that they have this patient currently in-house. So you want to be able to provide tangible resources, tangible directions for your staff um, after education. <clears throat> so I recommend um, before launching your program to know, um, to, to establish your program goals, to establish your educational materials, your internal procedures and resources, <clears throat> and your plan for program implementation. All of these components may change, but I, I do recommend having a baseline starting point. So currently at Dignity Health, the um, educational modules that we have are Human Trafficking 101, Human Trafficking 102, and Human Trafficking 103. So 101 covers um, <clears throat> basic education. What is human trafficking? What are the legal definitions? Uh, what are some common red flags in the healthcare setting? And then we include um, steps for frontline staff. Our 101 education is meant for all staff. So we have uh, basic instruction for, for anyone, from someone in the gift shop to a physician on the floor. Human Trafficking 102 covers victim-centered care, trauma-informed care, and goes into procedures in a little more depth. And then um, Human Trafficking 103, uh, we include 10 case scenarios based on um, actual examples uh, shared by um, uh, survivors of labor and sex trafficking. Um, so uh, we have actual uh, interactions between a victim and, and a healthcare system, what happened, and then real advice from that survivor. <clears throat> um, we use these case scenarios once we've implemented 101 and 102 education. Uh, these scenarios really help staff to think critically about what they've learned in the first two sessions and um, uh, recognize which resources they should be grabbing as their next step. And I'll talk a little bit more about 101 and 102 education shortly. Recommendations for program goals. So um, at Dignity Health, our goals for our human trafficking response program are to impact both our facilities and our communities. So it's important to recognize that even if your facility is well educated and well equipped to identify a potential victim of, of labor or sex trafficking, 
and um, well equipped to respond to this person within your walls, the only way that you're really going to be able to support and empower this person on a long-term basis is if there are uh, resources in your community, victim response resources. Are there um, emergency victim response resources in your community? Are there long-term resources? Are there also opportunities for survivor empowerment? Um, all of these connections are going to be important for the long-term um, success of, of this person who's been identified as a potential victim in your facility. So as you establish your program goals, I recommend including efforts to reach out to the community and look for um, gaps and, um, and just to get to know what resources are and are not available. The program structure for our human trafficking response program was pretty complex and well thought out. So Dignity Health is one of the largest healthcare systems in the country, and we're the largest hospital provider in California. So with such a large system, we needed to be very deliberate and well informed on our approach. So we have this system-wide structure in place. First, we have our executive sponsors. So the current executive sponsors for the Human Trafficking Response Program are Paige West, um, Senior Vice President of Patient Care Services and System Chief Nurse Executive, and Elizabeth Keith, Executive Vice President for Sponsorship and Mission Integration. Um, whether you're implementing a program for a large healthcare system or a small hospital, I strongly advise identifying executive champions for the program. Um, I, I just think that's going to be vital, that leadership and value uh, for the program uh, comes from the top down. We also have, so we've got the, the two um, uh, executive sponsors, and then we have program leadership. So um, I oversee the program for the whole system, but then I partner with um, mission integration um, representatives in each service area. And we also have a steering committee. So the steering committee is uh, comprised of 12 members who are picked from across the system uh, so representing different service areas, representing different disciplines or, or uh, departments, and representing different levels of management. I think it's really important to have frontline staff in the room when you're talking about logistics around providing education and logistics around um, uh, victim response procedures. I think that you can create all these things on a very high level, but until you've got real frontline staff in the room um, to say where there may be um, a gap or an obstacle. So steering committee members. Um, we made sure to include steering committee members to represent security and registration, and um, th whichever department we were um, implementing the program, so we have emergency department leadership, also representatives for social work and for chaplaincy. Okay, so, um, I, uh, and then from there, we implemented a task force at each hospital. So for each hospital where we were going to uh, launch the program, we, similar to the steering committee, we established a multidisciplinary internal task force representing all these key departments who were going to come together and implement this program within the, ta within the hospital. So con again, consider um, having nearly 40 hospitals, we needed to have this strategic approach. So while I'm in touch with all the task forces, um, I'm not able to be on site uh, for each hospital. So each task force is, is taking the lead. And um, once we decided to launch the program at the end of 2014, um, what helped was to have a, a kickoff uh, 
meeting at each hospital. And whenever possible, we included a survivor speaker at these um, kickoff meetings, and I'll talk more about that shortly. So that gives a pretty good overview of our program. Um, other materials that we've included, uh, um, program materials that fall under this program, also included in the Shared Learnings Manual, um, include a, a human trafficking victims community resource algorithm. So again, it's important to have these materials in place before you launch your program. So our community resource algorithm includes key contacts for uh, child protective services, adult protective services, and law enforcement. So we tried whenever possible to identify agents or officers who specifically worked with human trafficking cases because they would be the most knowledgeable. Whenever possible, we included their specific information. But the point is you want to you wanna have a relationship with these local resources and ask them, what, um, who should we be calling first? Should we be calling the general line first or should we be contacting a certain officer? And that was different for each service area. We have a human trafficking case record which we complete for each case of labor or sex trafficking that we identify. The information captured on this case record helps us to hold a debriefing following that case. And in the debriefing we discuss what went right, what went wrong, and that information is used to refine our procedures and um, to provide uh, feedback to the community resources. For some cases, we had a great response from community resources. In other cases, not so great. So it's helpful to be able to provide feedback to law enforcement, uh, CPS, or say your local service provider. Other materials um, included uh, are human trafficking victim response procedures. And again, all these materials are in the shared learning manual. So basic education for all staff. Um, this is so important. Human trafficking is, is often misunderstood. And um, there are many misconceptions associated with human trafficking. And these misconceptions are often perpetuated by the media. So it's important to educate everyone from registration staff and security staff to physicians, nurses, and social workers on the realities of human trafficking. Because keep in mind, while physicians and nurses and social workers may see um, uh, uh, physical signs of trauma or abuse, a registration staff person or a security person may see dynamics happening between um, a patient and a companion in the waiting area or out in the parking lot or in the hallways. We had one case where um, a young adult female had presented to an emergency department and the emergency department was packed. It was a super busy uh, night and it was security staff and registration staff who saw red flags um, uh, between this person and her companions out in the parking lot and in the waiting room. So what I'm going to show here are some examples of actual slides from our Human Trafficking 101 uh, presentation. And so it's, it, our presentation is broken down into um, uh, deconstructing myths or misconceptions that are associated with human trafficking. And the summary of our 101 education is included in our shared learnings manual. So I'm not covering all the myths here, but if you want to see all the myths that we cover, you can download the manual. So the first myth is that human trafficking only happens overseas. This is a big myth. I mean, I can't tell you still um, how many people I come across that are shocked to hear that human trafficking is something happening in America. Um, for those of us who are working in this field, we, we think that awareness, that we've conquered that step sometimes. But the reality is we haven't. Um, so it's important that we talk about what human trafficking means in America to healthcare staff. So every country is affected by human trafficking, including the United States. These statistics are actually from 
2015, I believe. I got these statistics from the National Human Trafficking Hotline. So for those of you who are putting together um, information, or I'm sorry, uh, putting together education, I recommend going to the National Human Trafficking Hotline's website, and that is um, humantraffickinghotline.org. And if you click on hotline statistics, you can find statistics for your um, state. So we have hospitals in Arizona, California, and Nevada, and this is why we included um, some uh, information on those states. So for last year, 2016, um, uh, I don't have those statistics handy. But for, so for 2015, these were the number of uh, tips reported to the national hotline, um, and uh, these were the number of tips that involved underage victims. And also we include this um, map from Polaris. Uh, Polaris is the anti-trafficking organization which operates the National Human Trafficking Hotline. And it shows all the areas where human trafficking was reported in 2014. So in our um, deconstruction of uh, the first myth, we really spend a lot of time on what human trafficking means in America. And so we include the um, uh, legal definition from the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. And so per this legislation, these are the three victim populations um, for labor and sex trafficking. Anyone under the age of 18 who is induced to perform a commercial sex act under any circumstance. So this means there is no requirement to prove forced fraud or coercion. Anyone who's age 17 or under involved in commercial sex um, would be considered a victim of sex trafficking. And commercial sex is defined by the TVPA to include any sex act where something of value is exchanged. And this doesn't always mean money. It can, it, it can include drugs or it can include survival needs like transportation, food, a place to sleep. Anyone over the age of 18, 18 or over, induced to perform commercial sex through the use of forced fraud or coercion. And then anyone of any age induced to perform labor or services through the use of forced fraud or coercion. And this includes involuntary servitude, debt bondage, slavery. And then so we, um, as we cover this uh, myth in several slides, uh, we instruct all staff, if you're working with someone or if you observe something where you consider a person to fall in one of these three categories, this is what you're supposed to do. And at Dignity Health, that includes notifying your supervisor. And if the person is a patient, then you, you need to ensure that the um, physician or medical provider is notified um, or the social worker or the nurse shift manager or the, the nurse supervisor. Uh, let's see. Um, sorry, one more note about statistics. I know that in the healthcare fields, uh, folks always want to hear statistics, and statistics are pretty hard to come by um, because this is such labor and sex trafficking is such that it happens often um, behind closed doors. And so it's hard to uh, gather um, uh, concrete information or, or uh, gather data on concrete numbers. So I like to use the two studies that I mentioned earlier. Um, I also like to pull statistics from the National Human Trafficking Hotline and also the International Labor Organization has uh, good statistics um, for an, an international um, perspective on labor and sex trafficking. Okay, so the next myth is that U.S. or uh, only foreign nationals are trafficked in the United States. A lot of times when people um, uh, come to grips with, okay, maybe this is happening in the United States, but it must only be happening to foreign nationals. The truth is that U.S. citizens and lawful permanent residents are also at risk of victimization within the U.S. So these numbers here are also from 2015, 
but I think I have handy the numbers for 2016. So in 2016, there were over 7,500 tips of human trafficking reported to the national hotline, and at least 2,075 of these tips involved U.S. citizens or lawful permanent residents. So my story is an example of child sex trafficking in America. And in my presentation, I include um, a photo of Carissa Phelps and other survivors. Um, something that I do and want to emphasize um, here is to, whenever possible, include the stories of survivors. For me, I think uh, the story of a survivor is more impactful than statistics. So for Carissa, Carissa was trafficked for commercial sex when she was 12 years old. She ran away from home and um, wound up crossing paths with a trafficker. She published a book called Runaway Girl, um, and she also founded an organization called Runaway Girl. And so you can contact Carissa um, through her, her organization to request a survivor speaker. So please, whenever possible, whenever you're providing trainings, I strongly encourage you to include a survivor speaker who can share, especially a survivor who can share examples of um, healthcare experiences as a former victim. Um, I also want to point out that there are many memoirs written by survivors. And um, uh, I've learned so much from other survivors through their memoirs. And whenever I can, I purchase memoirs written by survivors and I give them out at my trainings. Um, so just to name a few, um, uh, Carissa has her book, Runaway Girl. Barbara Maya um, is a survivor of sex trafficking. She wrote a book called Nobody's Girl. Shima Hall is a survivor of labor trafficking. Um, she wrote a book called Hidden Girl. That's her memoir. And I just recently finished a book written by uh, Jasmine Grace Marino. Um, and I highly recommend this book because she talks about her experiences with healthcare while she was being victimized. Okay, next myth. Human trafficking is not or human trafficking and human smuggling are the same crime, so that's a myth. Um, think of human trafficking as a violation of a person's human rights and human smuggling as a violation of a country's immigration laws. So the way I explain it to staff is that a person can consent to being smuggled into the country, but if at any point along that process they're induced to perform commercial sex or labor through forced fraud or coercion, then they're a victim of human trafficking. And um, something else that I point out to staff is persons who have been smuggled into the country are at a very high risk of any kind of crime, including human trafficking. So it's important that we are um, educating staff about vulnerable populations at the same time as we're educating on this topic. Victims may not self-identify as victims. So another myth is that victims will self-report and seek help. Um, and, and the reality is that victims may not self-report for so many reasons. For me, as a 14-year-old victim, um, I, was, uh, I met this man that I was going to run away with and have this new glamorous life with at, my, at another mall. And he took me to uh, a motel room and um, began to go over what he called the rules. And so he gave me a new name and a, a new birth date and um, was giving me all these requirements and like how much money I was supposed to make. And it, it became clear to me very quickly that he was talking about prostitution or commercial sex. And um, I didn't, and he, he, he then punched his fist into his open palm in front of my face and told me not to talk to law enforcement. So that was all the intimidation that I needed. And I didn't immediately think, oh my gosh, I'm a victim of a crime, I need to run out of this door and find help, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm so stupid, I can't believe I fell for this. I chose to give him my phone number, I chose to run away from home with him, 
Um, I could only see the choices that I made. And that's very often true for labor and sex trafficking victims. We can only see the choices that we made. We don't see how we're being manipulated, exploited, or victimized. So oftentimes victims of sex trafficking, especially youth, do not self-identify as victims. Due to prior abuse, they may not realize they're being manipulated or exploited. Sex traffickers often target abused and vulnerable youth. Um, it's very common for traffickers to target kids in foster care or group homes. You know, they're looking for kids for, uh, uh, for where abuse has perhaps been normalized. Um, victims of sex or labor trafficking may blame themselves. They may fear authorities. They may fear retaliation by traffickers. Foreign national victims may not speak English. They may not know their rights in America. They may have signed a contract and, and think that they're legally bound by this contract. So even if they're in front of you receiving health care services, they may not reach out for help because they may not even know that it's an option for them. So we can't depend on um, uh, victims to, to self-disclose. Uh, another um, myth is that all sex traffickers are stereotypical pimps. Um, the reality is that anyone can be a trafficker, a family member, a friend, a neighbor, a gang member. Um, the term pimp is often associated with a stereotypical pimp. Uh, like, so think of the flashy hat and the clothes. Um, and so uh, even though these pimps are still in existence, they're, they're really no longer the norm. Uh, I have here a, a mugshot of a 28-year-old who was sentenced to 30 years in prison for charges related to selling a 13-year-old girl for sex multiple times out of a strip club. So I, I include his photo in my trainings so that staff can see just how young and approachable a trafficker can be. I mean, this guy looks like, you know, someone that would be totally approachable in a mall. Um, I uh, gained permission from the Washington County Sheriff's Office to use this photo. So as you're putting together education, um, be sure to cite all of your resources and to gain permission for any photos used. So pimping has become so normalized, even glamorized in the media, that many young men and boys, especially gang members, want to become pimps. Uh, gangs consider it easier to sell a person for sex than to sell drugs or guns. Because if you're caught with a drug or a gun, um, or if you sell a drug or a gun, it's gone. Um, but you can sell a person for sex over and over again. Also, if you're caught, say, if you're pulled over and you have drugs or guns, there's a bigger chance you'd be arrested than if you have a person with you. Um, another thing is gangs have easier access to drugs and guns, which are used um, as an additional way to control victims. So anyone can be a trafficker. Um, there was one case where a mother sold her 7- and 14-year-old daughters for sex. This is one case that I include in my training, but there are numerous cases of family-controlled sex trafficking. So staff need to know that victims are diverse and traffickers are diverse. So family-controlled sex trafficking could present as potential child abuse or domestic violence. Pimp and gang-controlled sex trafficking could pre present as uh, potential physical or sexual assault or domestic violence or intimate partner violence. This is the last myth that we include. Um, uh, human trafficking refers only to sex trafficking. So it's really important that staff understand that human trafficking is an umbrella term. And it includes both labor and sex trafficking. And, and staff really need to be educated on um, common factors to both labor and sex trafficking. So here are some common factors to labor trafficking. Victims may be charged a fee that's impossible to pay off. This is debt bondage. Victims may be forced to work 12 or more hours a day, seven days a week. Victims may not be allowed to leave the work premises, may be forced to sleep on the floor or on a cot in the back of the business. Victims of domestic servitude may be forced to sleep in the home. Victims working and traveling sales crews may be forced to sleep in a van. Um, 
some common um, red flags for sex trafficking that we include in our presentation are, so for sex trafficking specifically, frequent or untreated UTIs, STIs, bladder infections, drug-related health issues, complications related to abortions, repeated abortions or miscarriages, pelvic inflammatory disease, pregnancy with little to no prenatal care, suicide attempts. So I recently um, uh, co-authored a chapter um, with Wendy Barnes, another survivor of sex trafficking. And, and in this, it's, uh, the, the, the book is called uh, Human Trafficking is a Public Health Issue. And it's, it's a great book, lots of really informational chapters. Um, I highly recommend it. But in this chapter, Wendy describes how she and other victims often used suicide attempts, not as um, always a real attempt to commit suicide, but as a real attempt to get a break from the life they were being forced to live. Uh, and then another red flag specific to sex trafficking is um, foreign objects impacted in the vagina. So uh, there, a person can present to the emergency department with um, baby wipes or... Um, sponges, cotton, impacted in the vagina. And this is because victims are forced to work through menstruation and pregnancy. So they may be forced to use these strategies to continue working. Um, also, we have had a vic we've had cases where um, uh, a victim presented with other objects impacted um, with perhaps uh, att attempts by the abuser to humiliate or um, uh, um, just further terrorize this person. So some other uh, myths that I haven't included here, but we do include in our presentation, and you can see um, more information from our shared learnings manual, is that uh, sex trafficking could never occur in a legal setting like a strip club. That is a myth. Um, sex or labor trafficking can occur in any industry, any business um, setting. It, it doesn't matter um, if the location is, is legal uh, or not. If any person is induced to perform commercial sex or labor through force, fraud, or coercion, then they're a victim of human trafficking. Um, only women and girls are victims of sex trafficking. That's another myth. Men and boys are also victims of sex trafficking. Um, traffickers often target young men and boys living on the streets, many of whom identify as LGBTQ. So those are just a couple of other examples of, of what we include in our uh, 101 education. So basic education essentials. For those of you who are going to be providing basic education to staff, um, please be sure to include uh, descriptions of vulnerable populations whenever possible. So in our shared learnings manual, we have what we're calling an assessment tool, and it just describes some strategies for healthcare staff to uh, actively assess vulnerable persons for human trafficking concerns. And so um, those who are most vulnerable to human trafficking would include persons working in the commercial sex industry, whether it's a legal industry or an illegal industry, undocumented immigrants, persons struggling with homelessness, addiction, behavioral health concerns, persons lacking in family or community support. This would especially be true for young mothers, foreign nationals, and persons with learning disabilities. Um, sex traffickers often target young mothers um, they often may target, both sex and labor traffickers may target those with learning disabilities. Um, foreign nationals are often targeted by those of their own um, ethnicity uh, or background because um, it would be easier for a trafficker to be able to communicate with this person and build trust with this person. So we have to ensure that staff know not to assume that um, a, a person presenting as a family member is a family member. If there's any suspicions of abuse, neglect, or violence, we want to separate the patient and talk to them directly using a, an interpreter who is not a companion. And um, children and youth. Uh, children and youth with additional risk factors for sex trafficking would include history of abuse or neglect, poverty, history of running away, um, family members or friends already involved in commercial sex, uh, bullying, difficulty in school, 
lack of supervision, history of foster care, behavioral health concerns, LGBTQ or other minority status, missing or absent parent, and then substance abuse. Um, again, include survivor stories whenever possible. This is Wendy Barnes. Wendy authored um, a memoir called And Life Continues, Sex Trafficking and My Journey to Freedom. Um, another survivor that often works with Dignity Health is Annika Mack. Um, Annika was trafficked for about nine months and, um, and then was hospitalized for a month once she escaped the trafficker. So uh, both Wendy and Annika have a lot of experiences um, in the healthcare system. So we don't invite survivors to come and share their story just to hear a survivor's story. We reach out to survivors who uh, want to share their story in a way that would help educate healthcare staff on um, what they can do differently, what they can watch out for. Include red flags in the healthcare setting. Um, the National Human Trafficking hotline used to be called the National Human Trafficking Resource Center. And under that name, they published a resource called Identifying Victims of Human Trafficking, What to Look for in a Healthcare Setting. And I've, I think this is a great tool. It includes lots of general indicators and health indicators of um, labor and sex trafficking. You want to include the roles of frontline staff. So you want to make it very clear in basic education what is expected of folks. People are going to be um, very impacted um, by your education, and they're going to want to know tangibly, what do I do if I see these kinds of red flags? Um, know that in my experience, educating frontline staff, um, a lot of folks want to know, especially nurses, they want to know what's going to happen if they report red flags. So, for, so you'll need to decide how much time do you have to provide education um, uh, that, that may vary. But for, for some nurses especially, they may want to know everything that's going to happen. What all steps do you have planned out? Because they want to know if they report red flags for this person that that the right thing is going to happen. Otherwise, they may not have the confidence to, to report um, the red flags. And then also include the National Human Trafficking Hotline, which is listed here. This is available 24-7. Um, and it is available to healthcare staff to call and ask for help. I mean, if, the, if I have been present for um, victims presenting or potential patients presenting with red flags, and it can be very stressful. And so um, the national hotline is there to support either victims or um, healthcare staff. You just want to make sure that healthcare staff are mindful of HIPAA um, considerations when seeking guidance. Um, so call specialists with the national hotline speak both English and Spanish, and they have access to over 200 languages through a teleinterpreting service, and um, they can help connect to local resources. But I do recommend that you have a plan in place in each facility to um, actively connect with community resources because, you know, community resources are always changing. And um, um, they're always closing. There's new ones opening. And, um, and then you also want to you wanna gauge who you contact next based on the experience that you had with other cases. This is another reason why it's important to complete case records and debrief on each case. Um, so uh, let's see, some other, there, there are many other survivors with healthcare experiences, both labor and sex trafficking. I could sit here and name them all. Um, if you email me, I'm happy to contact you or provide some contacts but know um, that the National Survivor Network is a great resource. I think their, I think their um, website is nationalsurvivornetwork.org, all one word. You can request a speaker through that resource. And one more thing I want to mention. Um, when you provide basic education, I think it's very, very important that you have chaplains and or social workers present who have gone through the education and so they're going to be present to support staff. 
I have provided trainings to staff across our system numerous times, and I have had staff self-identify as victims in the training um, uh, based on what the knowledge that they learned in this presentation. They put the pieces together for an experience that they had at another time. Um, I've also had staff disclose um, things happening to their children, and I've also had just staff become very overwhelmed by the content and start crying. So um, we want to be mindful of supporting our staff and our colleagues and make sure someone is, is available. Uh, because if you're presenting the education, you may not be able to, to stop and support someone. Extended education essentials, um, uh, especially for patient care staff like nurses, physicians, social workers, they need to be educated on victim-centered care, trauma-informed care. I would provide some suggested questions uh, for when staff are working with a um, patient determined to be from a vulnerable population. Excuse me. And um, again, we have that assessment tool. Uh, included in our shared learnings manual, and I, I included a lot of um, uh, questions from other resources out there, like the Vera Institute screening tool. I included some questions from, from there. Um, you want to have your internal protocols ready and provided to staff and uh, case scenarios. So I'll talk a little bit more about victim-centered care and trauma-informed care. So a victim-centered approach means that you are um, uh, actively prioritizing a patient's wishes, safety, and well-being. So you want to seek and maximize input from your patient in all decisions regarding care. So when you, when you talk to staff about um, uh, uh, victim-centered care, um, you want to um, reinforce the idea that if they're working with a patient who really is a victim of human trafficking, then they've just been through an experience where someone else made all decisions for them. This person, this, this um, trafficker, um, potentially uh, told them when they were going to eat, when they were going to sleep, what they were going to wear, what they were going to do for work, how long they were going to, to work. Um, I've had survivors share that they had to ask their traffickers if they could use the bathroom. Um, so if we are truly invested in, in helping this person, um, we want to empower this person as much as possible in all aspects related to patient care. And we want to recognize that there's a chance this person may not be assertive enough to um, uh, uh, state how they're feeling or what they need. So you want to, whenever possible, check in with them. Always try to provide options. Uh, um, and always try to maximize whatever it is they're, they're, um, they're providing input on. And um, it's important, I think, to talk to the person discreetly, um, asking them how they feel about one thing or another in front of a group of people. Um, they may not feel empowered to, to really say what they're feeling. So we want to maximize the patient's input in all decisions regarding care. This includes if and when to contact law enforcement or other resources. Now, this is often a hard um, concept for healthcare staff to, to take in. Um, so some, for, first, I want to say off the bat that we are mandated reporters. And when we're mandated to call law enforcement or CPS or APS, we're certainly doing that. But the... Uh, you can't provide victim-centered care unless you know when you have to contact law enforcement or another authority against your patient's wishes. So our education on victim-centered care and trauma-informed care is very heavy on mandatory reporting requirements. Um, we, we even include in our resources some guidance on when staff need to contact authorities. Um, because keep in mind, if you're working with a potential victim of sex trafficking, that person could have been arrested for prostitution three times last week. And so the idea of you calling law enforcement um, may not be seen as, as a form of help. 
And um, if, you're, if you're working with a foreign national victim, they may have concerns around immigration. Um, so we, we want to be openly empowering, talking to and empowering our patient in, in all decisions. And when we're talking with them, um, definitely disclose your status as a mandated reporter and explain the limits to confidentiality in a way where you're not discouraging this person from disclosing. Um, So I think that's all I wanted to say about that mandatory reporting. Um, okay. So staff are not expected to save victims. Um, we make it clear in our education that the Human Trafficking Response Program is not a program to go out and rescue people or save people, because many victims may not see you as someone who can help them or may not be in a position where they're ready to accept help. Um, and, and this takes a lot of the, the uh, stress um, off of, of the healthcare worker. We expect staff to know the red flags of human trafficking, to watch for red flags of human trafficking, to follow, to know and follow protocol, which includes creating a safe and private space to talk to this person about what resources are available to them, about what rights are available to them. Notifying law enforcement and other authorities only when mandated. And if this person doesn't want um, authorities to be called and you're mandated to, we will continue to advocate on behalf of this person's um, concerns with authorities. That's a key to providing victim-centered care. Uh, and then know what community resources are available. Know what is and is not available. So we've got resources available to staff, um, listing contact information and descriptions for local resources. And, and we create a, um, uh, an atmosphere where this person is receiving human kindness and dignity and respect for whatever choices they make. Um, we're, we're contacting law enforcement and other authorities as mandated by law, but um, creating an experience where we hope this person will be welcomed back or will feel welcomed back if and when they're ready to accept help. And I can provide examples of um, victim-centered care and trauma-informed care being very successful um, uh, in, in some of our cases at Dignity Health. I want to make sure there's plenty of time for Q&A. I really could go on, but I'm going to try to wrap it up here. All right, so our goal is to create an atmosphere in which um, uh, persons would, be wel would feel welcomed back. And um, something else that we do is we provide national human trafficking hotline cards. So these are available from the Blue Campaign. Um, which is a resource from, the, from Homeland Security. They provide resources to give to um, uh, frontline responders. So you can order these cards. And this is, this is an example. This is an enlarged photo, but um, uh, they're about a business card size, and they can be broken down into three smaller sizes. So um, this, is, this is one example. Like this small size can be broken down. This small size can be broken down. They have cards available in different languages and different photos. So this is supposed to be representative of sex trafficking, potentially. And over here is labor trafficking. They're called hotline shoe cards. And the only bit of advice that I'll give you there is if you do uh, order these cards, know that a lot of our staff thought that a shoe card meant that we automatically slipped this item into the person's shoe if we thought they were a victim, and that's not the case. We want to make sure that we are offering this to patients as a resource to take with them if they want to. For, for um, many, it may be dangerous for them, to, for them to have something like this on their person. So another option is to help this person memorize the national hotline number. And I always like to end with this photo from the Coalition to Abolish Slavery and Trafficking, or CAST. This is a very dark and heavy topic, and I think it's important to weave in the idea of hope, because there is hope. When I think of survivors of labor and sex trafficking, 
this uh, this is how I see them. I, I've I've shared a stage with um, survivors of human trafficking across the world, and um, I, I know so many people who are empowered and working as um, social workers or some, many mothers, fathers, college graduates. Um, and Carissa Phelps is a lawyer. So just because someone is a victim of human trafficking doesn't mean that there's no hope for this person. Our healthcare staff can be a part of this person's journey to becoming empowered. Um, but that needs to come with uh, a well-informed, compassionate, respectful um, interaction with healthcare. And it's, and it's got to there's got to be long-term services available as well. So together we can make a difference. Everyone on this call with similar programs in place, we all increase our chances to identify victims of human trafficking in any healthcare facility across the country. So we can start to change the numbers that we're seeing in these studies. We can properly care for trafficked persons. We can connect them with the appropriate um, community resources. Whenever possible, look for survivor-led uh, community resources. Um, for me, at age 14, had I been connected with a survivor mentor or a survivor-led service provider, I think that would have been just key to, to my having um, a, a quicker recovery. And we can make a difference in our communities. So I think from there, we will go ahead. Let me just make sure there's nothing else I wanted to mention. Um, one more thing. So again, the shared learnings manual is available from the Dignity Health website. That's dignityhealth.org backslash human trafficking response with dashes in between the words. Um, my email is holly.gibbs at dignityhealth.org. I'll be providing other webinars on this topic. Um, we have our first annual shared learnings conference this year in San Diego. Um, uh, so it'll probably start out small, but we are looking to have one each year to grow and be specifically tailored to the healthcare field. And um, we may start a networking conference call for those who are interested. So with that, I'm going to open it up for Q&A. Thanks, Holly. And I'd like to remind our listeners to continue to submit their questions via the chat box as we begin the Q&A portion of the presentation, and we will get to them in the order in which they are received. Our first question, Holly, is how can, uh, excuse me, in your experience, are victims who blame themselves less likely to seek help and or to accept help? Well, I think that could be likely. Um, this is why I stress the importance of survivor-led services, victim services. Um, for me, um, even though, so the, the person who lured me away from home <clears throat> and um, forced me into commercial sex um, was caught and was convicted. Um, he was charged with uh, a sexual assault of a child endangering the welfare of a child and promoting prostitution. So again, this is 1992. There were no human trafficking laws in place. Um, <clears throat> I understood that I was a victim of a crime, but I, I really, I could, for a long time, I could still only see my choices, especially because there is so much stigma attached to um, some of these vulnerable populations. So there's the, the word prostitution is so highly charged and stigmatized that it automatically uh, sort of puts the blame on the person in commercial sex uh, before you even know his or her story. So once I started to meet other survivors in 2009, um, that was when I really started to see my own vulnerability as a 14-year-old kid. And this is you know, going into my late 20s by the time I finally started to meet other survivors. So for those of you who are implementing a program, in the beginning I mentioned the importance of having goals to address internal dynamics, but also um, having goals to address community resources. Find out if there are any community resources led by survivors. And if there aren't, 
is there is there a way to empower local survivors to do that if that's what they want to do? As a follow-up to that first question, Holly, and I think you may have addressed it, but you may want to expand a little bit more. How can health workers and advocates overcome the challenges um, or the barrier of uh, victims who are uh, less likely to accept help? Um, so it's a reality that patients that you think may be a victim are not going to accept help. That is a reality, and that can often leave healthcare workers feeling like they failed this person. And I actually feel very differently about that. So for one of the cases that I happened to be on site for, there was a, a young adult female. We identified her, staff identified her as having very um, significant red flags of, of sex trafficking. And um, so a couple of us talked to her. and. In the end, um, she was exhausted. This person was exhausted. She had obviously been through a traumatic experience during the night, and she hadn't slept. And so we needed her to accept help. Um, we needed her to stay at that hospital and wait for law enforcement, which law enforcement was on their way, but they were going to be a while. Um, uh, in order for us to sleep better that night, that's what we needed from her. But what she needed was to go to sleep. She wound up leaving with a family member because she was exhausted and needed sleep. It's very likely that this person reached out to the resources after um, uh, she left the hospital because she was open to receiving services. But I, I consider that case a success and other cases where the, the patient did not accept help because Wendy Barnes, she's such a, an amazing speaker, I can't emphasize enough, um, uh, including survivor speakers. She describes how every encounter she had, every positive encounter that she had with a law enforcement officer or a healthcare worker, it planted a seed of dignity for her. It planted a little bit of a counter narrative to what she was hearing from her trafficker and what she was hearing from, you know, buyers and other people um, within her life. Um, and slowly that, that grew into the self-empowerment that she needed to seek help. So it's about watching for red flags, following proper protocol when you see red flags, making sure this person is educated on what's available to them if, should they want it, respecting their decision so that they feel respected um, no matter what they decide to do and they'll know where to go when they do want help. I hope that's helpful. Holly, the next question is, what is one thing in your experience that you think is most helpful in helping survivors decide to move forward both with health care and maybe also reporting? I, I really can't stress it enough, having a survivor on site. Um, we're, we're actually working with CAST on hopefully um, uh, creating a pilot study where we will, where CAST will have a survivor as part of their um, response to the hospital um, system if we identify someone with red flags who, who's open to talking to advocates. Um, and, and our hope is to create some guidelines around including a survivor representative to respond on site with law enforcement or to a healthcare setting. Uh, I think that's really the key. I mean, as, for those of for those in the healthcare system who aren't survivors, I think um, um, providing compassion and respect and dignity. But uh, a survivor can talk to another survivor uh, um, just in a different way. Uh, it's just it's oftentimes an immediate connection. The next question is, what professionals both within and, and outside of the healthcare setting should comprise of the task force? So when I say the task force um, at our hospital, it's strictly an internal task force. So we include security, chaplains, registration admitting, um, emer uh, uh, department leads, 
uh, or department representatives like the emergency department, labor and delivery, um, social work. Um, those were the key departments that we started with. And from there, uh, we included other departments and roles um, whenever possible. For anyone from um, you know, communications and philanthropy to, oh, community health is also a key a uh, department or role that should be uh, a part of the task force. Key, Very, community health, if we're not making the relationship or, or establishing the connections between the hospital and the service providers, then it just won't be a successful program. And Holly, how can the pre-hospital communities, fire department, EMS, those responding to uh, providing first response, be integrated into a hospital-based program? So whenever we provide trainings at Dignity Health, we do open the trainings up to crisis responders, um, APS, CPS, law enforcement, EMTs, uh, anyone who, who may fall in that group. And those are real um, key partners in the community. So we actually had one case where um, uh, a um, patient was brought to the emergency department by an EMT, and it was information provided by the EMT that alerted us to this person being a potential victim. Um, it was dynamics of, the, of where the person was picked up, what it looked like inside, that provided the key information that we needed. The next question is, can you relist the red flags in healthcare settings and also identify where our audience can could go for more information on those red flags? So um, there is a resource from the, the National Human Trafficking Resource Center is now called the National Human Trafficking Hotline. Uh, but under the former name, um, the, the Resource Center published a resource called um, Identifying Victims of Human Trafficking, What to Look for in a Healthcare Setting. I have just found this to be a great resource tool because it describes a pretty comprehensive list of general indicators and health indicators of both labor and sex trafficking. As far as what we cover, um, I think I had mentioned some red flags for sex trafficking, which would include frequent or untreated bladder infections, STIs, drug-related health issues, complications related to abortions, repeated abortions or miscarriages, pelvic inflammatory disease, pregnancy with little to no prenatal care, foreign objects impacted in the vagina, and suicide attempts. And Holly, are those red flags listed within the manual? You know, I don't think they are listed in the manual, but um, probably most of what I, I just read off is in the, um, the National Hotline resource. Thanks, Holly. Uh, another question is, uh, where can participants find a resource which lists survivor-authored memoirs and books? Oh, gosh, that's a great question. I don't know of anything offhand, but, um, but I, can, I can list um, some again. So Shima Hall... Um, she published a, a memoir called Hidden Girl. Shime is a survivor of labor trafficking. Uh, Barbara Amaya published Nobody's Girl. She's a survivor of sex trafficking. Um, Wendy Barnes published And Life Continues, uh, Sex Trafficking and My Journey to Freedom. Um, oh, gosh. I, I think it's book. Uh, is it Bukla or Oriola? I'm not sure if I'm saying her name right. She published a book. Uh, that she's also a survivor of labor trafficking. I think it's called something like The Travails of a Human Trafficking Victim. Um, let's see. And then the, the one that I read most recently 
is by Jasmine Grace Marino. Um, and I just thought, it, for someone working in the healthcare field, I thought this was an excellent book. And it is called The Diary of Jasmine Grace. Thanks, Holly. What additional resources may be available to law enforcement or private investigators um, in helping them to identify signs that may have been indicated prior to um, a missing person or runaway situation? So additional resources for law enforcement. Um, you know, I wonder, Nadia, you might be, be better to a answer that question. Um, for me, I mean, I, I presented for, uh, before I joined Dignity Health, I, I consulted for Amber Alert's um, uh, training and technical assistance center, and I provided lots of education to law enforcement. Um, I also published a book in 2014 called Walking Prey, how America's Youth Are Vulnerable to Sex Slavery. So this book is written only really towards sex trafficking, especially child sex trafficking, but I did really write a lot of it with law enforcement in mind. Yes, Holly, thank you. And the Amber Alert Training and Technical Assistance Program, the program in which we are doing this webinar today, um, does provide training as it relates to human trafficking for law enforcement, um, and investigators, uh, as well as other multidisciplinary professionals. Earlier in the presentation, I referenced the Amber Alert web address. Um, you will also receive it via the handouts and the recording. But before we close today, I'll also remind folks of where they could find more information on training for law enforcement and investigators. Thanks, Nadia. Holly, where can our audience go about requesting training um, the 101, 102, or 103 programs uh, through Dignity Health? So if you go to our uh, website, uh, dignityhealth.org slash human trafficking response with dashes in between the words, um, you'll find a description of our program and you can download the shared learnings manual and there's um, uh, a contact person on there to reach out for trainings and consultations. Her name is Kathy Ng. Uh, but you can also reach out to me, holly.gibbs at dignityhealth.org. The next question is, do you believe that if healthcare providers and other frontline workers are aware of and informed of the various risk factors that make an individual vulnerable to potential trafficking, and then referring them to significant NGOs who can help address these issues is an achievable goal that could aid in prevention. Yeah, so in our 101 education, we focus on, we, we, we talk about um, the importance of knowing common vulnerable populations and knowing what resources are available to those populations. Because providing resources to a vulnerable person is our first line of defense against any kind of exploitation, including human trafficking. So for young mothers, it's important that labor and delivery know all the resources that are available to a young mom who may not have family support and may not know what's available in the community. Um, for, and also regarding prevention, say you're, you're a hospital who um, is doing your due diligence and getting education out and protocols and, and so you feel like your hospital staff are equipped and then you go out into the community and you, you see this you know, great resources for victims of human trafficking. Um, somewhere there needs to be a step of are there also resources for vulnerable populations? Let's, let's try to prevent this before it even occurs. Holly, what would you recommend for healthcare settings to ensure that their programs and their responses to victims are also culturally competent? 
Uh, you know, um, that's a great question, and I don't have a, a great answer for that. Uh, other than what what I hone in on is if you're working with someone and um, they don't speak English, and you think that they're a victim of some kind of abuse, neglect, or violence, don't assume that the persons with your patient are family members or that the persons with your patient are safe. So there's one survivor. Um, her name is Evelyn Shumbo. Evelyn is on the U.S. White House Advisory Council on Human Trafficking. And um, she was um, brought to the United States from Cameroon as a child and forced into domestic servitude. And while she was a victim, she um, uh, was taken to an emergency department after being assaulted by her trafficker. And so I, I have Evelyn coming to speak at our national uh, or our first uh, conference in San Diego, um, our first shared learnings conference. And this is what I want her to talk about, um, um, especially from a survivor's perspective, talk about the dynamics of labor trafficking, but also the dynamics of um, foreign national victims and what can we do better as a healthcare system to be more culturally informed? Thanks, Holly. And you may or may not be able to address this question, but it's related to school nurses and school settings. Uh, it's a two-pronged question. The first is, is it common for victims of trafficking to be attending school? And if so, do you believe or does the current program make training available for school nurses as well? Well, in our, so again, it's part of our program's goals to bolster not just the facility but our community. Whenever possible, if there's a, a local vetted community service provider or organization that's providing education on human trafficking, then, then we make those connections. Like if school nurses reach out to us, like here in Sacramento, we've got three strands global. So if someone reaches out to us wanting general community education, um, we would connect to them with perhaps three strands global. Uh, but in other areas, there, there are no local organizations um, providing education on sex or labor trafficking. And if we can't make connections, then we have our internal 101 education it is um, we have an edited version for for community for education in the community, and so um, the community health workers at each hospital can provide that education to anyone from you know teachers and school nurses to parent teacher associations. Um, that's something that we like to have available. But are victims of sex or labor trafficking attending school? Absolutely. Um, Teresa Flores is one survivor who comes to mind. Uh, she went to school the whole time she was being trafficked. Um, she would be a great resource to reach out to for additional information for, for school nurses. Um, and then I know survivors of labor trafficking who attended school while they were being forced um, uh, to work in some kind of domestic servitude. Thanks, Holly. And just to piggyback on your response, I would also like to um, point our audience attention to a resource guide that was developed by the U.S. Department of Education. Um, the Human Trafficking in America School Resource Guide um, was developed in 2015. It is available online at safesupportoflearning.ed.gov backslash human trafficking. Um, the Amber Alert Training and Technical Assistance Program has done previous webinars regarding trafficking in schools um, where you can also find links to that manual. And, Holly, I know that we are running a bit out of time um, to address audiences' questions, and I do not see any additional questions that may have come in that we had not addressed. So at this time, I'd like to begin to move forward with the close. Um, so your references here are listed on the screen. I'd like to point our audience's attention to that, where some of their questions regarding um, statistical data as well as additional resources can be accessed. And I'd like to thank you, Holly, for providing insight and responding to our audience's questions. 
Um, I'd like to thank our audience for participating in this webinar and to remind them that future webinar announcements through the Amber Alert Training and Te Technical Assistance Program will be made in the coming weeks. Uh, Alice and I will turn the presentation back over to you for close. Thank you so much. Um, this webinar will be archived on OJJTP's online university in about three weeks. And for more information, please contact Fox Valley Technical College National Criminal Justice Training Center. You may also contact OJJTP or NTAC via the help desk by following the contact information on the slide. Thank you again, Holly, Nadia, and the rest of today's participants for a great discussion on this topic. And um, have a lovely afternoon. Thank you.